Welcome to another edition of Slave Food Conversations, where two African-American physicians, Dr. Columbus Batiste, cardiologist, and Dr. Eric Walsh, urgent care physician and doctorate of public health, explore the role of racism as a unique form of stress and the weaponization of food in the creation of health disparities in the African-American community, irrespective of income. They discover eating a whole food, plant-based diet in urban communities is possible and is the key to eliminating health disparities. The Slave Food team would like to thank you all for your support. Please continue to spread the word about the Slave Food Project and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Slave Food Project by clicking the subscription button. Today, the doctors engage in another stirring discussion with our special guest, Dr. Michael Greger, who is an international, internationally and well-known nutrition expert, physician, founder of nutritionfacts.org, and author of best-selling books like How Not to Diet and How Not to Die. As we take time to celebrate National Minority Health Month and Stress Awareness Month, this episode will delve into those two special topics and take a look inside Dr. Greger's award-winning books. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this very enlightening conversation. Oh, and don't forget to invite a friend. Thanks, Annette. I actually don't know if we can sit back and relax because Dr. Greger is working out and making me seem like if I'm a lazy guy, right? I'm a cardiologist. And I'm a lazy guy sitting down while this guy is working out. How are you? Where's your treadmill? <laughs> it's upstairs. I was doing the Peloton. We got to be Peloton all right. buddies. All right. All right. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Eric, how are you? I'm good. And I feel like I should be sending uh, Dr. Greger some tuition money. All of the nutrition I learned, I didn't learn in medical school. I, I learned it with reading his books and watching his videos. So I feel like I owe you something. Um, and um, we're just we're just really glad to have you on. Absolutely. So we're not going to spend too much time because we know your time is precious. We're going to dive right in. But I, I will be remiss if I didn't congratulate you. I think it's your 10 year anniversary for Nutrition Facts Out of the Work. That's right. Cong congratulations. Oh. Uh, did you did you envision all of this when you started that out? I was certainly hoping. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, I started Nutrition Facts because I wanted the nutrition resource I wish I had in medical school. Um, and so I was like, well, if no one else is going to do it. Well, I'll do it. Um, and so it kind of started as just really a pet project, kind of nights and weekends. I mean, you know, I had a day job, um, uh, but, you know, I had to give up my practice and turn completely to you know, writing, research, speaking to keep the thing, uh, you know, uh, to keep that new compelling content all the time. And I just feel like I'm reaching so many more people. I'm doing medicine on a kind of a much grander scale than I ever would really be able to kind of on a one-to-one -one basis, no matter how many people I could see in an hour. Absolutely. Well, we definitely can tell you we're two people who've been impacted by your work. So Aww. it is powerful and it's a blessing. So thank you for that. And I also I stumbled. I was ha having a late night. The wife was gone. The kids were doing other stuff. And I stumbled on this Seaspiracy. And, and given the fact it's Earth Day, I saw you in Seaspiracy. And that's phenomenal work. We don't have time to touch on all mm -hmm. the bounty of information there from Earth Day and preservation from our how our food impacts the environment, as well as looking at things like the uh, the the impact of food in the pandemic, right? Because Danette failed didn't mention how not how to survive a pandemic is also a third book you've written too as well. Um, so we're going to have to have you back so we can touch on those things as well as what we have planned for you today. So great job though on C on C Spiracy. You're gonna have to oh, send me your autograph. Wasn't that, wasn't that good? I was surprised. I'm you know, I mean, there's so many documentaries these days, it's hard to get me impressed. But that they actually <laughs> did a really good job. It no, was. Theirs was phenomenal. Phenomenal. And I was so glad, you know, I had no idea you were in it. So I'm watching it and I'm you know, I'm like feeling I like fish, you know, in terms of like I like fish, like a fish tank as a pet. So I was feeling so terrible through the whole thing. Like, this is horrible. That's what they do to the poor. And I love dolphins. They're my favorite animal and my favorite uh, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, but then you popped up. I was like, oh, they're even going to hit the, the health part of this. I kept saying, oh, they're not even touching on the fact this isn't even good for you. 
So I was yeah. really glad to see you. That was awesome. No, the funny thing is, I didn't know I was in it either. Like, they recorded, <laughs> well, they recorded it so many years ago. Um, I don't even, I don't even remember being interviewed for it. You know, I just, I, you know, I'll get in front of any camera and do it, you know. Um, and so I was like, oh, wow. and I was like, oh, I hope I don't say anything stupid. <laughs> <laughs> That's great stuff. That's great stuff awesome. right there. Awesome. Yes, yes, yes. So, Eric, why don't you start us off with the with the first first question? Okay, so, Dr. Gregor. so, besides, of course, Earth Month, and there's a lot of focus on the environment right now. Our focus is really on the health of African Americans, and this is also um, National Minority Health Awareness Month, which we take very seriously. You know, um, we talk about the environment, we talk about the day after tomorrow, but minorities die early today. We die from um, many chronic diseases today. And the question we often pose as part of our project is, why do black people die sicker and sooner than everyone else? Yeah, I mean, that, and that's something that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really kind of laid to bear. Death rate of African-Americans as much as six times that of white America. Um, and so that really gave kind of a harsh spotlight to the kind of the long-standing higher mortality, diminished longevity in general. Uh, you know, unfortunately, diminished African-American life expectancy predates the COVID-19 pandemic by decades. The black-white death gap is about uh, three years for women and closer to five years for men. Um, and now there's a lot of different things behind the COVID-19 death disparities. Uh, limited access to healthy food and predominantly uh, black communities, the housing density, the kind of need to work or else, uh, inability to uh, practice uh, social distancing, um, uh, but also underlying burden of ill health. And increased COVID-19 mortality and complications occur more often in people with pre-existing conditions like hypertension, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all comorbidities that are more prevalent in African-Americans, more high blood pressure, more diabetes, more strokes, uh, more likely to die at early ages from all causes put together. And the question is why? Why do black Americans live sick or die younger than their white counterparts? Well, one uh, big factor is a socioeconomic status. The United States race is closely uh, tied to class with African-Americans about twice as likely to be living in poverty. On average, uh, education levels lower as well. Um, however, even among African-Americans whose socioeconomic status is comparable to that of whites, despite higher education, more socioeconomic resources, health outcomes are still worse. Yes. And part of that has to do with lifestyle behaviors. For example, fewer than 5% of African-American adults meet uh, physical activity guidelines. Uh, smoking rates are actually pretty comparable, um, but African-Americans tend to be more uh, often exposed to secondhand smoke and have lower quit rates. And the fact that they quit um, less may be because they're more likely to use menthol cigarettes, which enhance the addictive potential of nicotine. And you say, well, wait a second, why? Menthol's because tobacco companies target marketing mm -hmm. of mentholated products to African-Americans, right? <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, and similarly, you look at food messages. If you look at uh, African American television shows, not only is black prime time containing the greatest number of food commercials, but African American audiences may receive nearly three times as many ads for low nutrient junk like candy and soda. Um, and that may be one reason why African Americans tend to consume fewer fruits and vegetables, uh, more likely to eat junkier foods. Um, and look, where are you going to get those fruits and vegetables? Fewer supermarkets are located in uh, black neighborhoods compared to white neighborhoods, as in four times fewer supermarkets. Uh, what black neighborhoods do excel, though, fast food. Predominantly black neighborhoods, 60% more fast food restaurants per square mile compared to predominantly white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I, I don't want to say that dietary behaviors um, completely explain um, the difference in disease patterns. There are certainly uh, differences in employment, poverty, home ownership, healthcare access, all of which can affect outcomes. Um, uh, racism, uh, income inequality contribute to these health disparities. But we have good evidence that simply eating a more plant based diet can more than help eliminate disparities 
in cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Hmm. Hmm. You know, that's that's so that's so important right there, what you mentioned. And we talk about that an awful lot about the issues of disparities in terms of like the access to food, for one thing. You know, I always give an example of kind of growing up and having to drive 20 some odd miles with my dad to go to the grocery store. But the one thing, though, that just struck me as you were talking is the fact that my perception, I don't have data for this, is that from, from growing up is that there's also fat, more fast food inside the grocery stores. It seems oh. as if there's more junk food, there's more quick serve, highly refined, ultra processed foods that are situated from a position of advertisement as well as for access inside of communities of color or inside of communities of, of disparate income that where we'll see that too as well, all of which kind of layer on that, it seems as if. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I mean, in these food deserts, it's not like there's not food in, you know, corner stores, but what's that food? That food isn't produce. There may be a few moldy onions in the corner or something, mm -hmm. but that quote unquote food really isn't food at all. But these, you know, highly processed, you know, food like substances, um, which are most profitable. I mean, look, I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, produce goes bad. It's the worst possible investment, right? In fact, they're like mm -hmm. loss leaders for supermarkets. Um, that's not where the money's made. The money is made for selling brown sugar water in a bottle for a couple bucks, dirt cheap <laughs> ingredients. It's all profit. Or a snack cake that sits on the shelves for weeks, right? Whereas, of course, produce goes bad. I mean, it's just, I mean, that that's just not where the money is. So it's not like these food corporations are sitting, you know, rubbing their sticky hands together, thinking, how can we contribute to childhood obesity, right? How can we kill people in this neighborhood or that neighborhood? What they're saying is, how can we make money for our yes. stockholders this quarter? And we got to make money selling cabbage or we got to make money selling, you know, you know, Funyuns or whatever other garbage is, <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, and, and the thing that they can set the price point to as well, that that's something negotiable for setting the price point, even for produce. It's up to the to the individual grocer and that location. Then you may see a price point that's different in one neighborhood as opposed to another neighborhood, which also can be concerning because it it almost prices you out of even considering these things here, too, as well. So it's 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 uh, it's definitely something else. So, I mean, you, you brought this up really, you did a wonderful and thank you for that. You did a webinar. Uh, I think it was during African-American black history month um, on a lot of disparities and so forth. And I think that that was powerful to kind of deliver that information out to the masses. So, and off the cuff and Eric will reel me back in cause he knows I tend to kind of go, go off the realms and so to speak, but how, how was that received when you gave that? Because you interact with, with hundreds of thousands, thousands, if not millions of people. How was that message received when you put it out there? Well, you know, unfortunately now it's, it's all virtual, you know, and so, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, there's only, you know, so many, you know, little snippets I can see of, uh, you know, of the comments, uh, uh, you know, kind of dashing by. Uh, you know, I used to be in the trenches, you know, I used to be, you know, seeing, you know, uh, you know, thousands of people on a day to day basis, you know, speaking, yeah. then I really get a sense of kind of what's happening out there and, you know, how things are received here, you know, it's like you put something on the internet and, you know, you can look at the comments, but you really don't have a sense of what kind of what kind of impact you're making. But I mean, in general, I think people are really appreciative. There's a lot of good um, discussion, uh, but it, you know, it's hard to know. You kind of throw things out in the void and you just, you know, frankly, whether it did good, whether it didn't do good, whether people liked it, whether people didn't like it, it was important information that needed to get out there. And so that's why I did it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what you yeah, yeah, built commend, your career on. Yeah, we commend you for that. that that's, it's not an easy message to put out there. Um, so we, we, we love the fact that you do that. Um, I wanted to, to follow up with something that probably Columbus was probably going here anyway. You mentioned, you mentioned racism is one of the things that you, you list uh, in the list uh, of reasons. We talk a lot about stress. And I think probably one of the most uh, damaging things to our health is unchecked, um, you know, uh, stress, bad stress uh, that, that many of us suffer from in terms of how it impacts cortisol and fight or flight responses and all these things. Talk a little bit about stress and diet and how, how, um, how both of those things kind of work together or against the health of the individual. You know, something I looked on, um, I did a whole chapter about in How Not to Diet, mm -hmm. about uh, the, um, the impact 
implications of weight stigma because of the prejudice against overweight and obese individuals. Um, then, uh, you know, they, uh, they ask people to do diaries and I forget, I mean, it's just the, the number of times people experience uh, prejudicial treatment being overweight in the society. Um, uh, I forget the exact statistics, but I mean, it was surprising both in the medical field and just kind of day to day living their lives. And you can actually correlate that with the levels of uh, of these uh, corticosteroids, these uh, ad uh, adrenal gland um, kind of long term stress um, indicators, and of course that um, puts you at greater risk of becoming more obese. You know, we mm -hmm. we, we know about there's a syndrome called Cushing syndrome. People get yeah. um, this excess body fat. Well, that I mean that's a hyper cortisol kind of scenario. So here are these people they get stressed. Um, because of their maltreatment, that makes them even more overweight, which may get them more prejudicial treatment, which, I mean, it's kind of this vicious cycle. And you can imagine a very similar thing happening, although I haven't looked at the data, um, with um, racism, coming up against racism day after day. Is that going to increase the stress, which is going to, you know, drive you to comfort foods? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, And that's just going to make... Um, your health, uh, you know, make these health disparities even worse. No, that that that's that's so true, and that's one of the things we bring out. And what's interesting about even this question and this topic is, sixty minutes to just did a piece in looking at the impact of racism and stress on on the health of African Americans, and and featured David Williams um, from Harvard. And one of the things that was really brought out inside of that discussion, many others, is the fact that there are plenty of studies that are showing a direct correlation from perceived stress whether it's stress or racism as stress and actual disease burden, but you tie it in together with nutrition. And, and I wonder and curious and in, in interested in whether or not the foods we eat, the animal products, can it stimulate a stress cascade in us or are the ultra processed foods or all of those things like that as well? I'm curious if they have an impact. I'm not sure if there's a lot of science on it, um, emphatically, but have you stumbled on anything about that? Yeah, just uh, on a short term. So you give people, uh, for example, a high protein meal, a high carbohydrate meal, a high protein meal, you get higher levels of cortisone in the hours after that meal. Um, and the question is, well, and, and you can kind of extrapolate that and say, well, if you did that every single day um, and had those higher levels of cortisone every single day, um, but uh, we, we only have those kind of acute studies and we haven't uh, I'm not aware of any studies that actually look people over months to see if they actually continue. Yeah, no, that's, 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 you know, with this being like a billion dollar, I mean, really the impact of health disparities is, is so profound. Why do you think there's not like the investment to really narrow this gap, you know, to, to increase the health? I mean, there's a lot of work that's being done at University of Alabama, Birmingham and, and others and looking at and tracking and seeing what's happening. But, um, why do you think, or do you think that there's anything in the pipeline with NIH that will really look to, to target this and to come up with a solution that we know could be found in nutrition? Well, I think, right, we have the solution. We know the solution. So for example, uh, the racial disparity for diabetes, for example, 36%. Um, so black Americans, 36% um, higher odds of uh, diabetes. But if you look at the comparison between black ve the diabetes rates among black vegans um, uh, um, uh, compared to, uh, to, uh, to, to blacks eating standard American diet, we're talking 70% lower odds. So it's more than twice. So you, you not only completely eliminate the, the disparity, the black-white disparity, but you get even more um, uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, you know, cutting out meat, dairy, and eggs from one's diet. Um, and so when we owe that to, uh, the, uh, seven day Adventist, um, studies Adventist two, which has a large contingent, not only of vegans, but a large African American contingent. And so we can look at some of the, we can tease out some of these differences and see, you know, how much, can be compensated or even overcompensated for by eating a healthier diet. And the question is, well, wait a second. If we know it works, why isn't it being done? That could be asked across the board. And I think 
uh, a lot of the answer lies in the in the incentives. I mean, you know, as doctors, you know, typically doctors are not reimbursed for just educating people about how to take better care of themselves. Um, there are some kind of creative models of, uh, you know, kind of group sessions with diabetics that, that you can get kind of reimbursed for um, through Medicare. But um, the system is just not set up to emphasize pre um, uh, uh, prevention. Uh, you know, medical education, both at an undergraduate level, simply isn't taught. Three quarters of medical schools, schools don't have a single dedicated course in nutrition. It's not, uh, we don't get questions on the boards about it. Schools don't teach to it. Uh, Postgraduate medical education, we're not seeing in residency programs, even in cardiology residency <laughs> programs um, and fellowships. And, you know, the continuing medical education typically, uh, you know, is big pharma. You know, it's, you know, we're not getting, you know, CME credits from big broccoli. Um, and so just the whole system. And that's because the system is set up. And as we have we have this unusual situation in the United States where we have a profit driven health care system. Um, and when there, and when it's for profit. Um, you know, what makes, you know, you, you know, drugs and procedures, pills and procedures are what makes money rather than, you know, giving people a prescription for healthy food. Yeah, no, that's so true. I, I trained at Loma Linda. And so a fine institution. And I feel as if it, it really situated me to provide excellent clinical care. But one thing I always reflect on once I came into the awareness of the power of nutrition, the power of lifestyle from a multimodality standpoint, exercising like you're doing, eating healthfully, sleeping, all those variables there. I realized I actually rounded it with one of the lead investigators in the Adventist Health Study. And I remember being on CCU rounds and crit uh, car coronary critical care units. And what's interesting, guess how many times we, we went specifically into the Adventist Health Study and the benefits of it as we were going through on rounds and we were going through the information? Zero, right? Ah. And, 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 and this is, and this, so when I'm in an environment where I'm given wonderful education, skill set for me to perform procedures, but then yet still the the medical community doesn't embrace this, even though it's where there's powerful information there. It's a problem. But I think the beauty of it, once again, is just that I think things are changing through like your efforts, through the efforts of American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We had Dexter Sharney on um, last year, probably about six, seven months ago. And the work Wonderful. you all are doing, I think it's it's phenomenal to educate physicians out there. So that's huge. That's really let me and let me jump in. I was actually published on as a major, my, a very minor contributor in one of the articles for the Evidence <laughs> Health Study when I was at Loma Linda. Uh, but Dr. Susanna Montgomery, who was my dissertation chair, she wrote a great article on how um, nutrition you could actually erase the uh, health disparities um, if uh, African Americans basically switched to the strictest form of the Adventist lifestyle. Um, um, and when I was at Loma Linda, that was one of the things that I thought was really powerful. And and I have to, uh, you know, what Columbus just said is really important. Nobody tr even tries. So it's it's deep because I, I think m many of our, our colleagues, it's because they don't know that they don't do it. It's, it's, it's just not valued. It's like like negative peer pressure. Like you look, you're looked at as a kook if you start talking about nutrition. Um, um, I, I think Columbus has experienced some of that. I know I have. Um, you know, there's a pressure to be up to date on medicine and on pharmaceuticals, not on anything else. And I, I think that's that part of the tragedy that we're not incorporating root cause um, solutions. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, I want to just say one thing about cost. I, th this is a question that came up during the uh, healthcare disparities. Um, this kind of this, this <clears throat> misconception that, you know, only privileged people can eat healthy right that it's ex it's expensive to eat plant-based foods but and i had to be like look i mean have you seen the price of beans <laughs> i mean they, they've actually done studies where they suggest that um uh you know family switching over to a vegetarian diet say uh, 750 dollars a year that's just on food costs forget all the health care savings right and so like a typical plant-based dinner, they were talking about red beans, brown rice, collard greens, sweet potatoes, cornbread, family for, uh, for under 12 bucks, three bucks per person. I mean, these are this, some of the healthiest foods out there. Some of the most nutritious foods out there are actually some of the cheapest foods yes. out there. And it's important for people to recognize that. Absolutely. Well, we, we, and we've actually begun to grow our own food. I mean, that's kind of our push. Um, even in little jars and, and plant. I mean, my wife is doing some amazing things just, 
growing food around the house. Um, we haven't even set up a greenhouse or a garden. So there's also that. I mean, there's other ways that we can actually get access to some of these foods. Yeah, I'm still working on my wife to kind of start her garden up there too as well. I'm still having to stay inside the freezer section for the moment, but it's, uh, no, she does a great job with that too as well. Same, I'm sure you or, uh, our wives could share notes on that. But, you know, I mean, I think this topic of really how we approach the nutrition and the perceptions out there is important. And I think that's really the question. I mean, so on a practical, tangible level, you know, tell us basically how not to die from racial health disparities. I, and I, now, listen, all I'm going to say is I want credit for this title when you come out with book number six. I, I just want I just want like a little shout out is all, all I'm right, asking all right. for. How it. not to die from racial health disparities. Yeah, okay, you got it right oh, here. We can do it. <laughs> I love it. Let's do it. Yeah. So, what do you so yeah. So I mean, the I mean, I think the the study uh, to look to is this um, the so called Regard Study, which is, stands for Reasons for Geographic and Racial Differences in Stroke Study, um, where they found that regardless of where African Americans live in the United States, they're more likely to uh, eat what the researchers referred to as a Southern diet. And this is a diet characterized by added fats, fried foods, eggs, organ meats, processed meats, and uh, soda, sugar, uh, sugar sweetened beverages. Um, and that it was this type of dietary pattern that mediates the majority of the racial disparity. Um, uh, and now we all know that there are, I mean, some of the healthiest foods um, are, are, you know, are, are, the, are the, you know, some of the foundational components of soul food, like collard greens, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, you know, dried beans and peas, black eyed peas, you know, okay. uh, blackberries, corn, okra, on down the list. But uh, there's also the dark side, which is the fat, sugar, salt, high fat meats, uh, fried chicken, chitlins, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, and we all know, of course, the roots of those kind of foods. And we we'll really need to go back to the foundational what what people were eating in West Africa, the predominantly plant based greens, fruits, legumes, nuts, whole grains, more vegetables. Um, yet these traditions, the West African traditions, were westernized, bastardized into this diet, high in fried foods and soda and processed meats. And uh, going back to that original foundational um, African diet um, would uh, really be the, uh, the, the best for everybody, regardless of their uh, race or ethnicity here in the United States. Absolutely. Well, you're just speaking Absolutely. our language when you say that, because that's literally what we talk about. I've, I've visited Ghana and some other places and just been blown away at the, at the foods that they offer there that we as African-Americans have kind of never even been exposed to. Yeah, you know, and, and I think, I mean, I have to tell you, so uh, for years or for years, once I started on this venture to really try and educate my patients and do all this other business out of clinic, I started giving them little how to's and jumping at things. And I'll tell you, it beat me to the punch when you came out with the Daily Dozen. All right. You came out Daily Dozen. That was part of my whole punch, my ah. whole tagline. So to tell the folks in a practical fashion and what I love about the Daily Dozen, not just because they say great minds think alike. So I like to think I'm in the in the presence of That's great right. minds like you. Right. Um, but tell 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 the folks how practically on a daily basis you can jump in. You can do things like this. Do the do the uh, Daily Dozen to change your life. Yeah, so uh, it's uh, that was the second half of How Not to Die. These are the kind of healthiest of healthy foods I encourage people to fit into their daily routine. Uh, available as a free app, iPhone and Android, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen. It's basically just a checklist of all the healthiest things I encourage people uh, um, to try to get. So we're talking about, you know, I'd like to eat, people to eat berries, the healthiest fruits every day, greens, the healthiest vegetables every day, including specifically cruciferous vegetables like uh, collard greens, kale, broccoli. Um, legumes, everyday beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Um, and so uh, I just go down the list again, just kind of as an aspirational goal to remind people, you know, at the end of the day, like, oh, I didn't even eat any beans. All right, we got to figure something up into, we got to open up a can of beans for uh, to, to dump some on our dinner <laughs> salad tonight, you know. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, uh, that's, uh, um, uh, you know, you can uh, get the book from your local library or uh, just check out the free app. Um, and, uh, and I, I just, I find it's often easier 
um, uh, more palatable, no pun intended, for our patient population to tell them to add healthy foods to the diet. Now, in the back of our mind, we're thinking, we know secretly that, you know, fitting in all these healthy foods, it's kind of by definition going to be going to be crowding out some of the less healthy options, right? Yes. Um, but but we're not saying that explicitly. We're like, look, we got, you know, I want you, you know, a piece of fruit or every single meal I want, you know, and, and, and the more, you know, there's only so much room you got in your stomach, only so many calories your body will take, take in for the day. And so the more we can add these healthy foods, it just crowds out some of the less healthy options. So you get kind of the best of both worlds without, you know, kind of, you know, wagging our finger into our patient's faces being like, you know, no more pepperoni pizza, no more, you know, on down the <laughs> list. Um, as a way to kind of ease people into eating healthier. Absolutely. And Dr. McGregor, I know that the guys will have you on forever. Um, you, you'll feel like the, oh. you're on a treadmill. You had a soft, <laughs> yeah. soft stop at, in 30 minutes. So we yeah, don't do want to run. But oh my God, it's been so great to talk to you. <laughs> you know, wonderful work. We Thank appreciate you. you. Appreciate you. Yes, you yes, so yes. Thank you. Appreciate you being on. All right. So, guys, I know y'all could just be there all day and just let him talk and talk. But I thought it was very insightful. And some of the things that he was saying speaks directly to what you guys have been saying all along. Um, so I think it, it is very helpful when you have a change in the messenger, um, because, you know, in terms of like how you can hear and, and perceive that message very differently, similar to, you know, how a child might hear, you know, the mom's voice versus the dad's voice. And so I felt like it's as far as you know, Doctor Doctor Gregor's voice, it was it was very refreshing, even though the information was very similar to what you guys you know have shared week after week. So, Eric, what are your thoughts on some of the things that you you guys you know what what Doctor Gregor shared? Uh, in a word or in a statement, he nailed it. I mean, mm -hmm. um, literally every aspect of what we talk about, he hit um, and settled right where we settled, which is despite the stress, despite the um, even the racism of this country, uh, it is, the food has the power to reverse the negative health outcomes. And I mm -hmm. think overall, that's that's a big part of our message. I think uh, the other thing that I, I really wanted to get in with him with was about the microbiome. He mm -hmm. talks a lot about it. And the gut, yeah. We, we, we didn't, yeah, we didn't have a chance to, to go there, but um, Someone I thought said, it was, I thought it was back. Phenomenal. Someone said, that's easy. Yeah. Just bring them back. <laughs> our, our audience already has your answers. What are you talking about? Bring I love it. That's right. <laughs> that's Look right. Ahead. No, there's, there's, yeah. there's, such, there's such a wealth of information to really dig into. And, I, you know, I'm going to tell you, it's just the longer that I, 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 I learn and I'm sitting inside of the whole plant-based world and looking over research and listening to other colleagues, the more I'm inspired. And so he's inspiring just from the standpoint it's not always easy for someone to kind of tackle this subject, right? Because he's tackling a subject subject that as a public health physician, which he is to as well before, this is the most important fire to put out are disparities, right? And disparities simply means differences and unnecessary differences that are persistent. And that's what we have to narrow this gap in terms of disparities. So I think it's powerful to hear another voice. Mm -hmm. I think that there's so many different areas that we can touch on you know, whether or not just the interplay between like the environment, the animals, but our bodies, most importantly, in terms of our health and our wellness, we didn't get a chance to touch on mental health. That was something I wanted to touch mm -hmm. on um, was mental health with him. But but good, the good part, even though he, he wasn't able to kind of touch on that, we are going to have someone we'll talk about later on in the next couple of weeks who will touch on mental health um, and the role of food with that, which will be a great segment too as well. So I've got a question for you guys. And and of course, us being slave food, you know, just definitely being as candid as possible. How important is it that you guys feel like in terms of hearing those messages from non-blacks as it as it as it relates to black issues? Let me let me say that. I'll jump in and answer this one. I think truth is truth. Yes. Right. And absolute truth is what we're after. And if it's the truth, then it's not going to be one sided. Like one group of people are going to all agree to it. The fact that we have not just uh, Dr. Michael Greger, who we just had on, but people like Joe Furman and others who are well-known people who, you know, there's no, you know, they make no money off of saying the things that they say, but they say the exact same things, which is, right. one, the stress of racism <laughs> damages health, and two, a whole food plant-based diet actually can improve and reverse some of the negative impacts that society has put upon us that create the health disparity. So 
uh, I think it's very valuable that when something is true, it's just true. Uh, this mm -hmm. is really what's just happening, and these are some of the solutions. Okay, and Columbus? No, absolutely. You know, it's not an issue of color. It is an issue of color, but to Eric's point, truth is not has no color. And we're looking for people to convey the message of truth. And so as we look at this information, it's clear there are disparities. These disparities are impacting the entire nation. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at, well, why are these, why do these disparities um, exist? Which is hence the question, why do black people in America live sicker and die sooner? Mm -hmm. And so when we look at that, it is indeed multifactorial. It's not just one aspect, but a central core component is nutrition. And we look at now the layers that come into this, that play a role in why we eat the way that we eat, why we live where we live, why our education is the way that it is, why we're perceived the way that we're perceived, and how all of these different layers of impact can play a role in our health. That's, that's powerful. It's important to understand. And there's power in learning that to change the paradigm, to change the mm -hmm. paradigm going forward in the future. So um, with regard to, you know, the Adventist Health Study, and I know that that was something that was discussed here, and I know you guys kind of touched on um, the, the Adventist message and as well as with regard to, to health and how it is perceived in the, in the industry and, and within the world. Can you guys kind of elaborate a little bit more in terms of the credibility that that Adventist Health Study has placed on that, that health message? You can go first this time, Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The tail end of that question in summary was uh, how the Adventist health message has played a role on the on Adventist health study has played. A oh, role. Do you listen, I'm going to tell you that the Adventist health study probably I don't have statistics on this, but my impression is one of the most quoted studies um, around the world globally that as a frame of reference. So inside of medicine, we have something called the Framingham Heart Study. Right. And that's something where we make all of our recommendations based off of blood pressure, off of cholesterol, looking at cardiovascular risk factors. And it's a group of predominantly Caucasians in the original cohort. And we follow those individuals through. Well, in like kind, we now have a group that's been followed of surveys of trying to figure out what their life expectancy is like, what their development of disease is like based upon their nutritional patterns. That was an ingenious mm -hmm. research. That was something that was a foundational bulwark for going forward for, for um, now until the foreseeable, foreseeable future. And so that's something I would love to emulate in my own uh, practice of, with my own community that's there, because I think it's so important for us to know that information. Great. Eric, did you want to add to yeah, that? Okay. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I was actually a small part of that study. I did some recruiting stuff, some of the uh, work in the community around that study, so I was mentioned as an author on one of the papers, like it's a very small, small part, but um, this study is, it's actually changing the way nutrition is actually seen because of the variation in diets in, in Absent the Adventist, minus cigarettes and minus alcohol and a few other things. It gives you a really unique group of people um, where so many things are all, you know, kind of factored out because of the lifestyle, but diet varies so much. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would say probably the most powerful thing about the study is how well it lends its, it, the evidence to the power of a whole food plant-based diet. And as, as Dr. Petit said, I mean, it is highly, highly um, uh, referenced. I mean, Dr. Fr I mean, almost every book I read on um, nutrition talks about that study. So um, you can't underestimate the power of it and the power of the Adventist lifestyle, honestly. Um, and that's what I was, and, yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you in terms of the day of rest. Like, what you know, how does that mm. play into, you know, the stress factor and how you know food is processed as a result of your stress because you have that day of rest in, involved. Yeah, that that's that is a key. I mean, I'll tell you, many times when people enter into the realm of nutrition and they get excited about it, which I love, and they become passionate about it, which I love. Sometimes we lose sight that there are other aspects that play a role in, in health. We look at our relationships, how we deal and how we choose to love people versus hate. We look at issues in terms of how we move instead of sitting. We look at issues in terms of how we sleep or we rest. And so increasingly, I'm literally seeing this more and more frequently that whether or not we characterize rest as a day of rest, whether or not we characterize rest as a period of time that we sleep from seven to nine hours, whether or not it's time to kind of 
come away from your daily burdens, your week, your burdens, and take a vacation, that when you don't do these things, you're more inclined to have ill adverse outcomes, as specifically as it relates to the heart. That's for sure. Nightly sleep, we know not getting sleep, we know it increases your risk of high blood pressure, increases your risk of high blood pressure and, um, and heart disease. We know that your risk of, of heart disease is increased when you don't take that day of rest and have time a, apart. And there's plenty of studies that are increasing that are showing this. It is extremely important. Eric, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. yeah, I would just jump in and say that the reason that, I mean, there are, you know, we have uh, Jewish Hebrew people have been doing this um, for you know centuries. Um, and one of the reasons it's so powerful is it's not just rest like sleep. It is a de-stress. It is actually an active process of moving away from the things that, that really cause you harm and leaning towards a source of strength. So, I mean, if you step back and you look at um, uh, uh, drug addict, uh, alcohol um, uh, addiction recovery um, through like the 12 steps, one of the things that they, they, the people who created that realized that is that you can turn things over to a higher power, um, and it will allow you know kind of allow your your spirit in a sense, uh, your emotions to heal. That's what the Sabbath is supposed to do: give you time to turn things over to your higher power, um, to to rest from the weight of the world. And one of the things that when you really study the origins of the Sabbath, especially if you look at the Old Testament or the Bible, it's a, it was a time of it's a time to, to think about redemption and even sanctification. And one of the things that translates to me in modern times is forgiveness. Like, um, do you forgive mm -hmm. others that have harmed you? And do you forgive yourself, mm. right? That, that's, do you allow yourself to be redeemed? Um, and we live in a society where a lot of people really treat themselves pretty harshly about yes. past mistakes or whatever they've done or bad relationships or you, know, you can't forgive someone. And so, you know, I, I, I think it, as Dr. Matisse said, it is one of the most important things that we can do is to um, make sure that we are remembering some of the other things besides just diet that allows us to heal. Yeah, and you just with that, just ahead. with that, real quick, with the uh, forgiveness, people don't forgive themselves for perhaps just even if they eat something, right? So when they get on this journey, they beat themselves up because oh, I had a piece of this, or I did this, or others are super critical. And that's what Dr. Greger was really highlighting when he was speaking about the prejudice and stress that people who are um, obese or overweight experience is that there's a sense of judgment that's that's levied on them. That is an inappropriate mm -hmm. and not acceptable level. Because I'm gonna tell you, people who may be a little bit overweight wear a scarlet letter. People who are who appear to be normal weight aren't necessarily healthier. They're doing the same thing and may have what, what's called tofi, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And you're encased in fat and you're encased in this negativity on the inside. And so I think that this process that we cannot reach our potential that that is in store for us if we can't learn to get, forgive ourselves, right? And get past some of these very simple things like that, um, get rest, all the things that Eric mentioned as well. So we got a question, Dr. Patisse, what are your thoughts on what they say of drinking five ounces of red wine every day for the heart? I heard another <laughs> doctor say that in his book. Yeah, no. So what we know is we know that there are certain things like resveratrol. We know that there's, uh, which is comprised in red grapes, it's in some nuts and legumes that are out there. And that's where the benefit is. We know that you get plentiful amounts of antioxidants from your berries and from your grapes and the skin. Right. So even as we look at this whole COVID period, we're looking at the fruits, the elderberry and, and the real strong components are comprised in the skin. So, no, you don't need to start drinking alcohol in order <laughs> to preserve your heart. Right. We don't we don't we don't don't want to pickle your heart. <laughs> we, want, we want your heart to be vibrant. We want it to pump and be effective is what we want. And so one of the key things I encourage people is to, to eat your food. Don't drink your food. And that goes across the board. And so then it makes an automatic transition over into alcohol just because of the fact I encourage you not to drink your food, the juice, the sodas, but eat it, eat the fruit. That's where you're going to get the true benefit that's there um, for you. There are last is that there are some suggestions inside of studies really about some degree of 
of harm, whether or not it's in terms of arrhythmic, arrhythmic burden for the heart, whether or not in terms of at certain levels that people may develop issues in toxicity with the heart muscle, usually at larger levels. We may even see some issues with cancer too as well. So we have to be uh, aware and careful of our approach when it comes to certain things. So I never advise start for purposes of health. So one of the things that he let, mentioned, let me, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Let me just quickly jump in and say on the alcohol thing, we do know that alcohol is a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. It actually does cause cancer. In fact, women who drink just one glass of wine a day have higher risk of breast cancer. Um, not only that, it's one of the major causes of mental health issues because of its addictive nature. And of course, all of the social impact that comes with DUI. Um, and so, you know, I always you know, try to encourage patients that this is something you actually want to limit and do not look at alcohol as a medicine because mm -hmm. it has too many horrible side effects even if what they were saying is true, which I, I don't think that the data actually backs it up, the side effects would not be worth the medicine. So one of the things that Dr. Uh, Gregor mentioned on the call, I mean, on today, was just you talked about the advertisement to the Black community, and he also talked about, you know, the, ben the business benefits, like in terms of, you know, they're not doing it intentionally to harm us, kind of what as he paraphrased in terms of, of the comment um, with, with regard to that. Um, you know, they're there. The business of business is business. They're trying to make money. They're trying to make money in the best way that possible in our communities. And this is the way that they do it with, you know, with what we have, the fast food and things of that nature. How um, how comfortable are you all in saying that you feel that the intent is not as intentional to harm our communities with the things that are that are brought into our communities? Want me to jump in first? Yeah, sure. you go first. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I think I think money is the root of all evil, so to speak. Right. I think that that drives people. They make decisions. They fracture relationships. They will step over a dead of or over a person who's on the ground to get to whatever it is they're trying to achieve. And I think that they're doing it at no cost. Now, to say that they're doing it blindly, that they're unaware of the consequence of it. That's a whole separate discussion. Is mm -hmm. there so is their intent? So their intent may be to make money like a drug dealer. Right. But that's not we can't confuse it with the fact that they're that they are unaware of the consequence of the foods that they're selling, of mm -hmm. their of their actions inside these communities. And they're they're one they're working under this guise of saying, well, hey, it's 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 it's, it's everyone has a free choice. Everyone has a decision. They don't have to buy it. But the reality of it is, is that you set up people in this convoluted uh, society that we have where food is subsidized, where mm -hmm. advertisement is subsidized by our tax dollars, where mm -hmm. these things are, we we are zip code and the redlining has created these pockets of disparate communities that have a high likelihood of having a preponderance of these ill ill uh, forming foods. It's hard to, to escape that. It's hard mm -hmm. for people to, to escape this brand recognition that they learn from a young age when they're inside the rat race. And so it is a societal problem. And so what will it take? It's going to take society to change it. And that's part of what we're trying to do is develop a grassroots um, level, as well as to then go on the higher level for political determinants of health. We speak about social determinants of health, but political determinants of health are really what's needed in order to change the politics of how some of these things are really implemented on a structural level. Yeah, Eric, did you want to add or you're good? Well, let me let me give you this one. The there was a question. Um, in addition to awakening people to the importance of healthy eating, what can be done to weaken the grip of meat and dairy industries on both people and government? So we'll give you that one. That's kind, of, that's kind of a continuation of the last question in a way, um, because you know here's the reality: if you sell a project pro a, a, a product that is legal but damages people. Um, and you know it damages people, which clearly no one, they all know it, it damages people. You have some, to me, you have, to me, you have some moral culpability. I mean, you have some responsibility for what's happening. Right. Um, and so when we look at the meat and dairy industry, these are very powerful products that are embedded into our society deeply and early in our lives. So when I was in grade school, and it's probably still the same way, you got milk automatically with your government lunch if you got government lunch. A carton, you, right. There, milk there, milk. Little milk carton, cheese with it, and you had, you actually had posters up in the school um, touting the benefits of, of how healthy milk is. I didn't know all those years that as my mother and I were believing that we needed this 
cow's milk to be healthy, it was literally making us sick. Every winter in Connecticut, I was congested. I had all these problems. I mean, the, you know, the pediatrician tried everything and it, none of it worked. And, and I, now that I'm older and I have none of those problems, since I gave up dairy, I realized it was the product. Now, these are very profitable industries in part because our tax dollars help subsidize them. Even when Dr. Greger was talking about um, the advertising and how advertising targets black people, something we talk about all the time. People actually, it's, actually, it's one of the places people ask us a lot of questions about or push back on. And he said the exact same thing. It, it targets us. Um, these industries literally take our tax dollars in order to turn around and make these, these foods seem healthier than they actually are, when they're actually detrimental to your health, um, and to make them cheaper than they're supposed to be. Right, so that it's easier for everyone to afford them, especially poor people. After you've glamorized them, and everyone you know's got a milk, had a milk mustache on in the nineties. So right, I, you know, I'll combine the two questions and say I think it's it's incredibly unethical from a big picture of things, um, and you know, it's a high cost that society pays in illness and death. Right. Okay, Columbus, are you good? You good? Yeah, no, I mean, every I accentuate, I mean, I acknowledge everything Eric said. He's absolutely spot on. Add in there too, as well, like a comment said, you know, there's, you know, a high preponderant of, of ethnic minorities, racial minorities are lactose intolerant as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you have this food cycle of like you're being forced to eat this food and you get used to living as this is a state of normalcy. <laughs> that you're going to get the runs after you drink milk or whatever it may be. And mm -hmm. that's not normal and it's not fair and it's not right mm -hmm. um, to have that. So when people decide, this is a question, when people decide to move to eating whole food plant-based, how do you suggest they cope with turning their backs on longstanding family traditions? That's the key. I'm going to jump in there. That's the key. You don't have to fully turn your back on, on longstanding family traditions. I mean, one of the things we always talk about soul food, right? And all of us, you grow up and whether or not there's some, some remnant of soul food probably in, in many uh, communities of color. And so but really what we're looking at is that we also have to look at the fact that there was resiliency that was brought in. So you're looking at the greens and you're looking at the berries and you're looking at all of the different components. For me growing up, New Orleans, the main components, we're looking at red beans and rice. We're looking at all of these other aspects that are there. You can still make a healthier version of macaroni and cheese if you're feeling like you, you need to have it. And what's evidenced by that is whenever someone cooks the food, it's about the flavor. It's about the spices. It's about the love that you put into it, right? You can still have your sweet potatoes. You don't have to throw in a bunch of marshmallows and butter on top of it. I mean, <laughs> that, that, that sweet potato is rich. It's sweet when you get the natural cinnamon. flavors that start to burst in your mouth, right? So you can still get that. You get the cinnamon and nutmeg on there and cook just right. And so all of a sudden, all these spices and aromas, because I'm going to tell you, our desire for food is, in, is tied to our memories, it's tied to our memories, it's tied to our emotions, and that's what creates our culture. And so it's important to create new memories and new family experiences around living healthfully and adding to what we're doing. And that's one of the key things we were trying to tease out towards the end is what are we adding? What are we doing for our health on a regular basis? I wanna, I wanna just chime in there. Um, you know, you, 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 food is a, is a construct that we create in a sense. And so you can create a new construct um, by creating healthier foods for your family. And I want to jump back to the, to the lactose intolerance. I did just read a book by Dr. Neil Bernard. He has a book on hormone balance. And he talks, uh, he talks about how lactose breaks into the lactose and, and um, glucose and actually damages the ovaries, um, uh, the, the, the lactose. Profound. If anybody has not read that book. And how that impacts um, women's monthly cycles, how um, how uncomfortable it becomes, um, fertility, all these different things. I thought it was very profound. It is a whole nother way, um, uh, you know, those things can happen as well. So the question is, is it possible to add um, plant-based lobbyists into the picture in order to counteract the meat and dairy industry who literally own many people in Congress? So I think he talked about, like, you know, there's no veggie, I mean, there's no broccoli, you know, lobbyists, but can you guys elaborate a little bit more on that? I think, you know, you look at the work of Dr. Neil Bernard and the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine who have have led the way in terms of bringing litigation um, for changing the paradigm as it relates to the way food is delivered in the hospital. I do an angiogram on someone who had a, a massive heart attack and there's a burger and fries in front of their face. That's unacceptable. 
right? And so he's doing a lot of work to kind of change the paradigm in terms of food and really um, bringing information, trying to bring in legislation. So you do have groups that are there, but, um, and I'm no politician, so I can't speak to it intimately. Eric is probably closer to that, but my impression is, I mean, these lobbyists, it's tied to money, right? It's gonna be tied to money. And so they're, le they're leveraging big wallets to influence what happens. And so they're, and so I don't know if there's that amount of resources available in the fruit, the carrot and broccoli mm -hmm. and radish industry in order to levy that same level. I, I don't know if that's there. Because the profit and margins that, aren't there, right? Correct. Exactly. Right. It's very difficult to, to, mm -hmm. to compete head to head with these big, look how long it took for, to, to, to really deal with tobacco and tobacco is still standard. I mean, we talk about how much less people smoke, but it's still a lot of people who smoke. Um, they still make their millions and millions of dollars even after everything has happened. So I, I would argue that one of the best things we all could do is to vote with our pocketbooks and yes. begin to stop buying some of these things um, and shit. And that is happening. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the um, the new uh, kind of meat replacement. A lot of the, this craze around meat replacement products, but mm -hmm. at least people are voting with their dollar away from industries that are, are, are very harmful and going towards more whole food and plant based options. Sure. And, and I, I know that, that's, that. yeah. And that, well, let me just add this because I think okay. that's such an important point. And then is the fact that the power of the people, the power of your dollar, mm -hmm. because 30 years ago, you didn't see these options. You didn't hear anything about plant based or vegan options or vegetarian options. You wouldn't go to the grocery store and see like whole aisles dedicated or, or uh, refrigerated sections dedicated or restaurants talking about this. But why are they doing it? Because they realize they want to tap into the market. They realize that right. dollars are there. So your dollars actually do impact decisions. And that's what we have to create. We have to create this understanding and this wealth of movement that can shift and change the direction of, of where this food industry is going. And that's the only way that we're gonna get be successful. We cannot wait for politicians to do it for us. We have to drive this through a grassroots effort. And I know we've only got a few, we only have a few more minutes, but we can't let this week go by without really addressing, you know, the, the George Floyd verdict. And, you know, in terms of, you know, stress being a key component of the slave food discussions, how, how do you all feel that, you know, the stress of our community collectively kind of like dealing with the George Floyd situations, police brutality, you know, us kind of being able to take a collective side just enough to realize that the fight has not, you know, is just getting started in terms of how we go about protecting ourselves and our and our people. What are your thoughts on on that? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in and say I think, uh, you know, had had this had there been no uh, guilty verdict, clearly the collective stress of of a lot of Americans, not just Black Americans, would have gone mm -hmm. way up after watching the video for the past year. So, you know, I think it, it does, but I think it, I think it hopefully is going to create some optimism because mm -hmm. I think now really, where do we go from here around issues of justice? And, and I, I don't think it's just justice. I, I think you have to go beyond that. We have to look at opportunity now. Where How do we mm -hmm. create the kind of opportunities in the kind of society where everyone has a real shake and people do better, families are stronger, young people have better options around education. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, opportunities to actually earn a, a, a living wage, or, and better than a living wage. I mean, we, we this is where we are now. I mean, right. we, if we, putting out these fires is great, but we really got to get to where we, we, we control the forest. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. I think that one of the things that we focus on in part of dealing with the stress, we focus on the stress, but we also are pivoting to focus on the resilience. And I think that tragedies like this that have been repeated throughout the the, the eons of time have been persistent and are, are very familiar inside many communities. And I think that one thing that's important is for us to bond together in a stance of resiliency. You know, and studies have shown, and I've mentioned this many times in terms of oxytocin during stressful periods of wanting to band together and what that does for your body and moving a community forward. And so we've seen a lot of that happen during this time of, of people of different hues and colors and tones coming together as we've seen before, and that cannot stop. What I'm fearful of is the fact that this will be seen as a victory. And so now we can take a victory lap and, re and rest. 
We can't do that. We have to continue to fight the good fight. So just because you lose X amount of weight or just because your diabetes is now resolved by using medications, I'm excuse me, by using nutrition, it doesn't mean now you can relax and go back to eating what you ate before. You have to be even more vigilant and to stay the course. And so we have to see translate that same sort of effort into disbanding this systemic um, uh, racism and disparities that, that persist in judgment based upon sight alone on the fact that of how I look. And so I think that's, that's key in my mind. I did feel a sense of stress um, before the verdict was released. I actually felt it in my body and I turned off everything because I didn't want to be distracted or have it when to put out my mind. Um, and then I did literally have some degree of relief afterwards. And I didn't think I would experience those, those, those features at all, but I did. Fantastic. Well, we'll go ahead and close out. So it's all, go ahead. You guys are good. All right. Well, you, yeah, you stay on with us, Danette, but you know, this has been, <laughs> it's been a great show. I've, I've, I've greatly appreciated um, number one, this post Gregor segment here and this discussion with um, Dr. Walsh and with you, Danette, I think it's been, it's been insightful and it's been, um, uh, uh, allow this to kind of get out some, some information. Dr. Gregor is always a joy. He's always a fabulous. If any of you have not listened to one of his short palatable videos on nutritionfacts.org, or you haven't read his book, how not to die, or you haven't read his book, how not to die. Now they're mouthfuls. All right. <laughs> it's going to take a while for you yeah. to get through those books. All right. <laughs> it put in some effort, but they are phenomenal. And so it's an excellent, excellent resource that's there. And so I look forward to the, the subsequent next upcoming shows that we have. But we'll go round robin and then we'll we'll tie into some of our upcoming things that we have. I was going to say, I, I totally, I totally appreciate Dr. Gregor. Like I said, I, I try to consume all that he gives. It's like it's like um, uh, audio digest uh, medical nutrition style for me yeah. um, because it gives me some really good information. Um, the other thing I want to say is I really appreciate those are are those in, that are watching and listening in our in, in our audience the comments. Um, it's really helpful, really a beautiful thing. Um, and we just ask all of you to go on our YouTube page and subscribe um, to us um, as we try and build this and grow this. Um, and today I think was a big step forward in getting um, having Dr. Gregor come on and really speak the same language we speak on this. So appreciate the audience. Pr appreciate um, my partner, Dr. Batiste. And of course, uh, my good friend, Danette. <laughs> um, we, we all went to college together. So it's a beautiful thing for us to be here, but we really want to thank our audience again. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And for yes. me, it's always fun and funny for me to watch you guys have people on the show that you are like huge fans of. I want to say that you guys did great and you held it down. I thought you were going to ask for autographs during the session, but I'm glad that, <laughs> that did not happen because you would have embarrassed me. But thank you for uh, keeping it together. Um, but, you know, it's it's I think what people are really appreciative on the show is the fact that they can feel your excitement for what you know, what you're sharing. And it's not you're talking the talk, you're walking the walk. And, you know, um, so I think the more we can continue to bring these types of guests to the program, the more we can enhance the community as a whole. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to go ahead and kind of put up some of these. Uh, uh, we have behind the scenes folks who are really always helping us out. We have obviously the Healthy Heart Nation led by Danette Batiste and Brian Hardy, who's behind the scenes. You can follow them, check them out at my Healthy Heart Nation, hhn.org. They've been helping to sponsor the show. Also want to once again acknowledge and make sure that you follow us on all channels, on YouTube at Slave Food Project, on Instagram underscore at uh, underscore Slave Food, and on Facebook, of course, at Slave Food. You know, next week we have a phenomenal, uh, excuse me, not next week, but we have a phenomenal guest coming up May 7th. May 7th, mark your calendars. We're gonna have a conversation this Friday. We're gonna have Dr. Uma Naidu, who is uh, an exceptional physician who wrote a wonderful book entitled This Is Your Brain on Food, where she really goes through mental health and the impact of mental health um, on the food uh, industry, excuse me, on, on your body. And so I think we're going to get some really tailored information uh, from that segment there. But looking forward to it. It's been a pleasure. It's good to see you all. Good show. Until Thank next you. week. Definitely. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. <laughs>